Today is a ministry training emphasis chapel, a convo where we talk about ministry training. It's the chapel where we talk about the church, the local church. That's why Dave Adams and Dave Wheeler and John Gaguzian are sitting up here because these are the guys along with their team and, and other professors, other members of the faculty and staff here at Liberty University where their passion and their heart is the local church. Because today the church is in a crisis. And I don't know that, uh, that maybe if you've noticed it, but we, we live today in a culture and a world where the church is being pushed further and further uh, away from the mainstream, where we're being told over and over and over again that we're not relevant anymore. And, and I just believe today that the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we this weekend will celebrate in churches all over the world, that Jesus came to this earth, that he died on the cross, that he was buried, and three days later, that he rose again on Resurrection Sunday when we talk about the power that is found in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the message that through the gospel is being told through churches all over the world. I believe the church today could not be more relevant. Do you agree with me today on that? that it is something that we've got to be passionate about. And so that's why today we want to talk about the church. Now here at Liberty, you guys are blessed uh, each and every week to hear from incredible uh, speakers from, from all different walks of life uh, that, that come here and talk to you about what it means to, uh, to be successful today of what it means to, to live out your faith on the world stage. And, and you've heard that from a lot of great, great people uh, over these last couple of months and throughout this year, this, uh, this school year. Today, what I want to do is not really talk about individually how we can be successful. I don't want to talk about how we can go out and accomplish great things for God. I don't want to talk about today how we can go out and individually be uh, something. What I want to do today is to talk about something that I think we desperately need in our culture today, and that is change. And that is change in the church. Now, we talk a lot here, and you hear it a lot, about changing the world. In fact, right behind me, you see it on the, uh, on the curtain here, Training Champions for Christ. And of course, the point of that, the purpose of that, is to go out and to change the world by being champions for Christ. We talk a lot about changing the world. But I believe today that really, if we're going to change the world, that what we need to be about is changing the church. Now, I told you a moment ago, the church is in crisis. It's not only crisis in crisis from outside, it's also in crisis from inside. Because you see, we, we know, the statistics tell us, that a lot of people are walking away from the church today. Uh, we're, we're told, uh, in fact, there was a recent study that was done that said that 70% of 18 to 22-year-olds will walk away from the church uh, during that period of time uh, for at least a year, in many cases, more than that. They will walk away from the church. And of that group, of that 72, uh, 70 percent, 52 percent tell us that the reason that they do that is, again, because they don't think the church is relevant, because they don't feel like it's something they want to be a part of, maybe uh, ethical or, or political issues or, or, or moral issues, those kinds of things, that they're walking away from the church in record numbers, criticizing the church because they feel like the church is not for them and the church is not where they want to be and what they want to do. Well, what I want to do today is talk about how that if we talk about how the church is not relevant, the church is not what we want it to be, that truly the only way to change the church is not to walk away from it, but to stay in it and engage in it. Criticism is never a way to, to see the change that we want uh, come about. Only engaging in the church, being part of the process, being a part of, uh, of that, that team that leads the church, that's where we see change. And so what today, today what I want to do is I want to go back to Acts chapter 11. If you have your Bibles uh, with you, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 11 because we are going to read a passage today where the church at that time is in a similar situation that I believe the church is in today. Uh, the crisis that they had is similar to, a different in scope, but similar to what we're facing today uh, in the United States, in the world today, in the church uh, of Jesus Christ. And you know, when, uh, in Matthew 6, uh, 16, when Jesus said to Peter that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, uh, in, in my mind, that statement that Jesus made should still be true today. Uh, I heard not long ago Francis Chan, you probably have heard of Francis Chan, an incredible speaker. Uh, he made this statement. He said the one thing that he sees about the church today is that the church has become way too stoppable. That's an interesting statement because if the gates of hell will not prevail against the church that Jesus said, then how is it today that we see a church that has become way too stoppable? Well, the way that I see that is that the church has become way too stoppable because the people of the church have become way too stoppable and the people of the church have become way too stoppable because we've become powerless. Powerless maybe because of fear, uh, because of anxiety, because of, uh, again, of not feeling the church is what we need it to be. 
And in Acts chapter 11, that was a similar situation. And today what we want to do is talk about from this passage of what we need to do to see real change in the church, the kind of change that we feel and we believe needs to happen if we're going to continue to be relevant and continue to reach out to the world with that life-changing, life-saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we want to read in Acts chapter 11, beginning with verse 19. It says this, now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The news of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So uh, Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples each, according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Now let me set for you a little bit of a stage of what's going on here in Acts chapter 11. We know if you go back to Acts chapter 7, the first martyr in the church, Stephen, uh, was stoned because he preached the gospel. He preached the message of what Jesus said, uh, that what Jesus did, that Jesus died and rose again, and that that is the only way to find salvation. And of course, uh, at that time, the leaders of the church did not want to hear of that message. That's the reason they crucified Jesus in the first place. And now Stephen is preaching that message. Uh, they're, They're tired of hearing it. They drag him out of the city, they stone him, they kill him. And then from that time, because of that, that the church begins to scatter. And of course, the reason they begin to scatter is because they're afraid. They're fearful for their lives. They're afraid of what uh, it might happen to them if they continue to live for and to preach the message that God had laid in their hearts and given to them through the message of the gospel, through what Jesus did on the cross. Uh, then Peter gets up and begins to explain and talk to those in in the first part of Acts chapter 11, those in the leadership of the church because they were mad with Peter because now he was taking this message, this this, uh, message that he had been preaching, and he was preaching it to a different group of people. He was not just preaching it to the Jews, he was preaching it to the world. He was preaching it to the Gentiles, doing exactly what Jesus said when he said, go into all the world and, and preach the gospel. And so they were upset with Peter. Peter, in the first part of Acts chapter 11, he explained exactly why it is that he was doing, because God had spoken to him and had led him to go out and to reach the world, to preach the gospel, of course, doing what what Jesus had said. Here in this last part of Acts chapter 11 that we just read, it says that because of what happened to Stephen, that the church scattered, that they took out all over the place, that they disappeared from where they were because they were afraid. And what they did is they went out and they started doing some different things. And so uh, I want to talk about what they did and how they did it and apply it to what we today need to do in the church to try to make the church what we feel it needs to be. Uh, Because when we talk about changing the world, I I believe firmly as it was in the scriptures, what Jesus said and, and his vehicle for changing the world is through the local church. Dave talked about that a few moments ago through the 7,000 churches that are represented here at Liberty University uh, of lots of different denominations, lots of different places, uh, churches all over the world that all have a common theme and a common message and a common uh, uh, mission statement of of, of preaching the gospel, of reaching people uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what we want to do is start talking out of Acts 11 how we can maybe apply this so that in the next generation that the church does not continue to get pushed to the side, but rather the church becomes the relevant force of change that we so desperately need in our world today. And the one thing that we've got to understand is great moves of God always happen in the midst of great challenges. In this passage we read in in the first uh, uh, verse that we read in verse 19, the great challenge was was facing the church because Stephen, a great pastor, a great preacher, a great leader in the church had been stoned for what he believed. And and so all of the people there were afraid, fearful that that same thing might happen to them. 
Now, if we lived in a culture today and in some places around the world, the persecution that takes place because of the gospel, but here in America, we're blessed. We're in a different situation. But if we today had to be fearful for our lives that people might kill us for preaching the message that we preach, for believing what we believe and believing in what Jesus Christ has done and that he died and that he rose again for us and sharing that message. If we believe that people might kill us for preaching that, it might change the way that we do things here. And the crisis that they face there is different than the crisis that we face, but the crisis that we face in America is this, is that the church is in trouble. And the church is in trouble because people are leaving the church, walking away from the church, discounting the church, dismissing the church. And we not only are allowing the culture to do that, but we're allowing that to happen within the actual church itself. That the church doesn't mean anything. In verse 19, when it says that those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, telling the message only to the Jews. In other words, what they did when they began to scatter in fear, they continued doing things the same old way. Now, that's a big problem that we have in the church today, because what we're doing in the church today is we're doing things that we've always done. We're doing it the same way that we've always done it. We're, we're involved in the same types of activities, the same types of ministries, the same types of services, sometimes the, the same type of music, and, and sometimes the same type of, uh, of, of, of looks of the buildings and the way they're, they're constructed and the carpets and all those kinds of things. We're doing things the exact same way that we've always done it. Now, there's a problem in that because what happens is if we continue to do things the way that we've always done it, we forget and we leave out a whole segment of the world out there that doesn't understand what it is that we did back in the past. And so we've got to understand that, that this great move of God that happened here and this great move of God that we're trusting God to do in our country and in our world today, it always happens in great challenge. Exactly what they were facing there. They were only reaching out to the Jews, preaching just to the Jews, because that's what they felt like that they had to do. And that's what Stephen got stoned for is when he went outside of that. But then it goes on, we've got to understand in this passage, verse 20, that some were willing to change the status quo. Some were willing to do something differently. Some were willing to step outside of their comfort zone and begin doing what they had never done before, to begin doing what others had been persecuted for, to begin doing what others had been criticized for. They were willing to step out. In verse 20, it tells us that some of them, however, men from Cyprus and, Cyprus and Cyrene, they went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord. You see, God's hand was with them. God blessed them because they were willing to step out of their comfort zone. Now, what we have today in the church today, when this statistic that I shared with you a few moments ago of 70% of people 18 to 22 years old that are walking away from the church, uh, leaving the church during that period of time for at least a year or more, uh, there are people that are walking away at the church, maybe not because they're mad, maybe because they're, you know, they're not angry with something that happened in the church, but they're disillusioned, they're disenfranchised with the way that the church is acting and the way that the church is reaching and the compassion that they see or the lack of compassion that they see in the church to do things in a different way. Now, I would submit to you today that the only way to try to see the change that you want to see in the church is to actually engage and be that change. And as a pastor, as a leader of a church, listen, there is nothing that we in the church would want more than for people to step in. And, and if they are you know, disillusioned, if they are disenfranchised with the way the church acts and what the church does and the way that the church ministers and the way the church reaches and the compassion that, that you feel needs to be in the church, we need you to teach us what that is. We need you to get engaged in the church and to, and to, to teach us and to show us and to, to prove to us that yes, we can step outside and begin doing things differently than we've ever done it before. That's what happened here. If you read in verse 21, it tells us that when they did it, when they did that, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now we also read in this passage that the church began to be skeptical that the church wanted to check out what was going on. And so they sent Barnabas to check it out. In, in verses 23 and 24, uh, it says this, when he arrived, they sent the news, of the, reach, uh, the news of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. And so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw the evidence of the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. Now the church was skeptical because they heard what was going on. 
They were skeptical because they, they, they wanted to send Barnabas out to find out, okay, what exactly is going on out there? Because they're not doing it the way that we have always done it. They're not doing it the way that we're supposed to do it. So they sent Barnabas. Barnabas came. He showed up. He checked it out. He looked to see what was going on. And he was impressed. He was encouraged. He was excited because he saw God's hand moving in that place. Now, the one thing that we've all got to get and we've all have to understand is this, is that God's people, even the establishment, even the older people, even the people that are always the ones that are, that are stuck in doing things the way that they've always done it, God's people will always rejoice and celebrate when they see true life change happening wherever it might be happening. When God's people are doing what God's called us to do, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He told us to go make disciples of all the nations. He told us to go out and to, to let people know about what he had done on the cross and, and what the resurrection truly meant. And so even the church that was skeptical in that day, even though they were wondering what was going on, so they sent Barnabas to check it out. Man, when they found out what was happening, they rejoiced. They were excited about it. And I would submit to you today that for the most part, and there are some churches that are never going to celebrate God's hand moving, if God's hand is moving in a different way than they're used to, but for the most part, Man, people are going to celebrate when they see lives being changed. They're going to celebrate when we see the church moving into areas that we've never moved into before. They're going to celebrate when, we, when they see uh, families that are being restored and people are coming to Christ uh, in ways that we've never even imagined was possible. God's people will always celebrate true life change regardless of where it's taking place. And we, the church today, we've got to get that, you know what, we've got to step outside of the comfort zones of life. You know the story of, of Peter when he was there in the boat with Jesus, and he said, if it's really you, let me step out and, and come to you. And so Jesus stepped out, I mean, Paul, uh, Peter stepped out of the boat and walked on the water to Jesus. He stepped out of what was comfortable, what was dry, what was clean, what was safe, and, and he began doing what no one else has ever done before. He walked on the water. That's what the church has to do today. And listen, I'm just going to tell you this, uh, honestly, I'm 46 years old. I'm pretty soon going to become, you know, part of that, that, that generation that they were the old guys and, and we don't have a clue what's going on. I'm just telling you right now, the only way that we are going to see the church do that today is not from people like me. It's going to be, we're going to see it from people like you. We're going to see it from the young people today, the next generation of leaders who will step out and lead us, lead the church. And to go into a place that maybe we're not comfortable, but God's hand is moving us. And I just believe that, that this generation of who I'm talking to today, that you're going to be the ones that lead the church in that direction, but you've got to be engaged and you've got to be willing to lead us. That you've got to be ready and prepared. That you've got to be passionate about what the local church is. That's why we wanted to spend some time today talking about the local church. Because listen, I, I'm telling you, Jesus established the church. Upon this rock, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates are always a, a defensive measure. It's never an offensive measure. It's not a weapon that is go, to go out against someone. It's always to protect, which means this, that if the church is going to do what Jesus intended for us to do, we've got to march into the gates of hell. We've got to march right into the places where the church is not welcome today. We've got to march into the places where the gospel is being ridiculed and, and people are dying for their faith. We've got to be willing to do that. And to be honest with you, you're the generation that's going to take us there. Even though the church was skeptical then, even though the church might be skeptical today, we still have to do it. And you've got to lead us there. When we understand when Barnabas showed up, not only was he impressed with what was happening, man, he went to find Saul. He said, listen, we need to celebrate this. He brought Saul back. Saul stayed, the passage tells us, he stayed there a year just to see what was going on. And I have no doubt in my mind that, that Barnabas and Saul, you know what they were there to do? They weren't there to lead. They were there to learn. They were there to learn from those who were stepping outside of the comfort zone. They were there to learn from those who were doing it a different way. They were there to learn from the younger Christians, the younger leaders of the church. And we need you to step into that same role today. We've got to understand that church change, we talk about changing the church. We talk about leading the church to a place that it's never been before, of you leading this church, leading the church to go to where it's never been before. We've got to understand that church change always leads to life change, which always results in world change. There's not a person in this room today that doesn't want to see a world that's changed. I believe everybody here today, we all, man, we talk about, we want to change the world. 
We, we want to see the gospel spread around the world. We want to see lives changed and, and transformed. We want to see families that are put back together, that are broken. We, we want to see marriages that are restored. We want to see families that have been ripped apart by the culture and ripped apart by all that we're facing today. We want to see God's hand moving in that regard. Let me tell you something. It happens to the church. And when the church changes, lives change. And when lives change, the world changes. And that's what we need to be passionate about. We look in, uh, in this passage we talk about in the last part of this passage in verse 27, it says, during this time when all that was happening there, some prophets, they showed up. They came down from, uh, from Jerusalem to Antioch. Uh, one of them named Agabus stood up and, and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world, that the world was going to face incredible challenge, that there was going to be difficulty unlike anything that they'd seen before. And then it says in verse 29 that the disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. And this they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. You see, what started out of fear, what started out of challenge of men and women that ran away because they saw what happened to Stephen, what happened from fear, resulting from fear, was a true life change that took place in their hearts and the lives of Jews and in Greeks of the entire world that was around them, their world. So what started in fear led to life change. From life change, what happened is that we see the world now begins to be changed because they, what happened to them, now they want to reach out and spread it to others. And so they heard about what was going to happen down in Jerusalem. They heard about what was going to happen in Judea. And so they stood up and they were willing to be counted. They were willing to show up to meet the needs of the people who desperately needed help far away. That's what can happen in the church today. Now, I'm not talking about and, you know, going out and, and missions work. That's something that we need to do and, and we're passionate about it. And, and so many of you are involved in that already. And so many churches uh, around the world are already focused on that and reaching and uh, impacting lives. That's something that's important. We need to be doing that. What I'm talking about is understanding that, that when we look at and see the needs that people have all around us, we've got to realize that sometimes the people that need the help the most are the people next door. That sometimes the people who, who truly need to experience life change might be living in the house next door, the apartment next door, the dorm room next to us. They might be living in our own household, our family members. And see, what happens is, is that when we get passionate about the church, when we get passionate about serving, when we get passionate about engaging and leading in the church of Jesus Christ, man, we begin to see things that we've never seen before. You see, what started in fear, those, those people that scattered because of what happened to Stephen, if they had never truly come to the place where even in scattering through fear, that they began to obey what God called them to do and obey what Jesus said to go out and preach the gospel, if they had never done that, then their eyes would never have been open to see the, the, the needs that were around them and, and the world would not have been changed at that time. We're talking about the early days of the church. And of course, we know that this was 2,000 years ago. And what's resulted and what's occurred from that is what started with just a few back then has literally circled the globe. And so we've got to get a picture from what happened here compared to what is happening today and start to understand and realize, man, we've got to engage just like they did. Now listen, there are times that we're, we cower in fear. We do so. We're afraid because of what's going on around us. We see anxiety in our lives for whatever situations that we're in. We see anxiety and fear in the church. We see anxiety and fear because we, we're, we're afraid to go out and to actually share our faith, to preach the gospel. It's easy to do it when we go on a mission trip. Man, it's tough to do it when we go next door. It's, it's easy to go and, and do it when we're, we're traveling around the world for a purpose, a, a specific mission of doing something. But man, when we talk about sharing our faith with a person who's waiting on us, on us at the restaurant, that, that's tough to do. Talk about sharing it with our family members. Man, that's really, really difficult to do because we're afraid. Because we're fearful of being rejected. We're fearful of, of feeling like we don't have what it takes. What am I going to say? How am I going to be able to do that? Let me just tell you something. That the same God who split the Red Sea for Moses and the same God that, that, that led Joshua across the Jordan River with the children of Israel, and the same God that, that, that literally rose Jesus from the dead, that God is alive today and He is your power and He's your strength. And so stand up in your faith and stand up in the power of God and realize that humanly, yes, it's impossible. But with my God, all things are possible. That we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. 
And if that's true, which I believe it is because I believe this book is the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God. There's not a mistake within the pages of this book. When Jesus says, when God tells us, you can do all things, I believe it. And I want you today to believe that. And I want us to believe it today in the conversations and discussions we're having about the church. I believe God can do in the church today what he did in the church of Acts. A church that is stuck in its ways, a church that, 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 that gets in a rut, a church that, that feels like we can only do it one way, a church that, that, that we can only have a certain kind of music, a church that, 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 that we're not willing to step outside, a church that is not willing to embrace people that don't look like us, a church that's not willing to embrace people maybe of a different color, of a, of a different background, of a different lifestyle. Let me just tell you something. The church of Jesus Christ needs to recognize that when Christ died on the cross, he died for all, for everyone. And I'm just telling you that for the church today to see that, we need you to lead the way. That if we're going to see the church today become what the church was in Acts, If we're going to see the church today go back to to what God intended for it to be, where the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and it doesn't matter what CNN or anybody else says, that the church is relevant and that the message of the gospel is relevant and that we have a place at the table where we can preach and share and that we can love the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, for that to happen, we've got to get a new vision and a new picture of what the church needs to be. And that comes through obedience. Some people say the church isn't relevant today. Well, I I believe firmly when we talk about the church being relevant, then I think we need to make it relevant by letting people see Christ in us in the way that we live. Some people today say the church is full of hypocrites. In some cases, that's true. So you you know how we counter that? We begin to live out in word and in deed the word of God every day. That we don't just do it on Sundays, we don't just do it in this room, we don't do it in campus church. You know what we do? Is we allow ourselves to be fully committed, fully obedient to the Word of God. Last uh, semester or last year, I'm not sure when it was, John MacArthur stood here and he preached an entire message on being a slave to Christ. Do you remember that if you were here? Being a slave to Christ. Listen, that's a seven day a week commitment. So you say the church is full of hypocrites. The only way to change that is guess what? To stop being what? Hypocrites to start living the Word of God. Some argue that the church is boring. And I've been to some churches, some of them are. Some churches are boring, I get it. So you know how we change that? We don't sit there and walk away and leave the church and and criticize the church. What we do is we get involved in the church, we get engaged in the church, and we help it to become vibrant and alive and exciting and a church that is filled with the Holy Spirit of God, a church that is not afraid to worship in ways that we're not comfortable with. And if some people in the church are not willing to stand up, you know, while others are dancing around, that's okay. Let them dance anyway. If some people in the church are not willing to raise their hands while others are waving their hands all over the place and jumping over the pews and and scaring people and they're they're, they're moving chairs out of the way for what they're doing, it's okay because people worship differently. Listen, when we worship a living God who raised his son Jesus from the dead for us, it deserves our entire lives and our bodies in worship. Do you agree with that? Some today would argue that the church is dying. And that's where you come in. Because listen, in, 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 some, in some estimates, in some situations, the church indeed is dying. And the only way to change that is, is for you to make a commitment to do something. There's three things. First one is this. Be willing to plant the church wherever God plants you. You know what that means? That means if you're going out as a business, you know, business leader or business owner, or going out as a teacher, or going out as a doctor or a lawyer or nurse or going out into whatever field that God's leading you to. You know what? You go out there, understand I'm going to be the best at that, but also understand that you can be a church planner at the exact same time. I met a couple of weeks ago with a group from Thomas Road uh, that 13 of them are actually up and moving out of Lynchburg. They're moving to St. Petersburg, Florida. And they're going down there. One of them's a nurse. One of, them's a, one of them's a teacher. One of them is graduating from law school this year, taking the bar this summer. One of them uh, is, uh, is training to be an IT uh, computer tech here at Liberty. They're, they're doing all these things. You know what they're doing? They're moving their entire families to St. Petersburg. They're all going to get jobs. They're all going to do what it is that God's training them to do through Liberty University. But you know what they're going to do differently? Is in the midst of all of that, they're going to work Monday through Friday on Sunday together. They're all going to plant a church. That's pretty cool. They're planting the church where God planted them. 
The second thing we got to do is we got to be the church no matter what we're doing. To be the church, to be an example of the church, to realize that people are always going to watch you and look at you to see how you live and to see what you do with your faith. And just understand that what you do on Saturday night matters just as much as what you do on Sunday morning on the front row of church. To make sure that we're being the church. I met a couple of days ago with a group from, uh, uh, one from Arkansas, one from Louisville, Kentucky. They're getting ready to move to New York City. They're planting a church on the Upper East Side. Uh, from 79th Street up to 92nd uh, Avenue or 92nd Street uh, in a place uh, called Yorkville up there in the Upper East Side of New York City. A place where in about 12, 13 blocks, 49,000 people live. 97% of them don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And there's only one church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what they're going to do? They're going to go be the church in that neighborhood. They're going to plant a church. They're going to start uh, planting the church. They're going to start in a museum. And they're going to go and they've talked to the person. The person's not even a Christian, but they're going to let them have it on Sunday morning. They're going to plant a church right there. You know what they're going to do? They're going to go out and they're going to build relationships, get jobs in the community. They're going to be the church seven days a week to build relationships so people can see Jesus in them. So it's plant the church wherever God's planted you. Be the church no matter what you're doing. The last one, some of us need to lead the church. To understand today that there are people in this room that you're wondering, okay, man, what is it that I'm going to do when I graduate? What is it that I'm going to do when I get out of this place and go out into, you know, into the world? What am I going to do? Let me tell you something. Pray that maybe God might call you to go out and plant a church to be a pastor, to be a leader in ministry. These guys are sitting on the stage. Man, this is, that's our passion is to teach you and to train you how to do that. And you need to be praying about that because there are people today who are criticizing the church and who are tired of the church because they're sitting around criticizing the way that the church is led and they're wanting to change the church. They're wanting the church to do something differently and they're waiting for somebody to step up and to take the wheel and to take the reins and to make the church into what they want it to be the church. I would submit to you today that maybe that person is you, that you need to step into leadership and whatever it is that God lays on your heart, however God is leading you, recognize this. To change the world, the easiest way to do it is to change the church. And as a pastor, I just want to let you know, we're blessed in this community with, with hundreds of great churches. And many of you are involved in a lot of these great churches. I mean, Gospel Community Church, Brentwood, I mean, Blue Ridge, lots of great churches around here. And whatever church you're part of, that's, that's awesome. But I'm going to tell you something, when you leave here, you leave here with a passion that regardless of what it is that you're going to do, Regardless of where you're going to serve, regardless of, of what, you know, what, what job that you're going to go out and let, you make the commitment and the passion that I will not be one of those statistics of 70% who walk away from the church. I'm going to stay in the church and I'm going to find a church that God is blessing and I'm going to find a church that I can be a part of. And if you can't find one, then start one. And you go out there and you change our world by changing lives, by changing the church. And I just want you to know this. What happened 2,000 years ago in Acts 11 can happen today, that the world can be changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the gates of hell will still not prevail against it. God bless you and thank you.